Okay, it's a couple of minutes past midday, so let's kick things off. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Gregor Evans. I'm the Managing Director of the night. Welcome to today's committee training webinar. Firstly, we would like to respectfully acknowledge the Boomerang people of the Kulin Nation and the traditional custodians of the land throughout Australia. We recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Our committee training webinar series is designed to equip committee members with the knowledge and skills needed to perform their duties and support functional, harmonious communities. Today's session is titled, The Role of the Committee of Management, and we'll take you through the roles and responsibilities of the Committee of Management. There's a total of 23 slides in my presentation today, and they will cover the key headings, such as key owners, corporation stakeholders, committee operation, best practice guide to committee meetings, committee meeting protocol, code of conduct, policy documents, and upcoming changes to the Owners Corporations legislation, the Owners Corporations Act. A few small housekeeping items before we get started today, just to make you aware that your microphones and cameras are disabled. However, there's the ability to ask questions via the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. A number of our team members are in the chat to help with answering questions. And also my colleague, uh, Tom Hood, who is one of the Knights Owners Corporation Managers uh, team leaders, will be live to assist me with answering any questions that may arise as well. So any questions we do not get to, either in the chat or within the presentation content, we'll endeavor to get answers to you uh, in the, uh, subsequent to this webinar in the form of an FAQ document. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and you will receive a copy of the recording as well as the slides after the event concludes. And also a brief explanation in terms of my, my facial as well as Tom, Tom's facial hair. We're both currently supporting the great cause that is November, raising funds for men's health by trying to grow some moustaches. So uh, apologies for that, for our, for our facial hair that is. Okay, without further ado, I'd like to uh, commence the, the training this afternoon. So I hope you enjoy. And uh, as mentioned before, feel free to ask any questions along the way. Okay, so starting with the key owners corporation stakeholders, we have the committee of management, the owners corporation chairperson, the owners corporation secretary, the owners corporation manager, the building manager or a building attendant uh, that we'll be covering today. There's also other owners corporation stakeholders such as service providers, but for the sake of this training, uh, they won't be covered. Okay, so starting with the committee of management. The committee is delegated powers to make decisions on behalf of the whole owners corporation. They are responsible for establishing standards and policies relating to various matters, including complaints handling, procurement, approval of invoices, and stem to management of the common property. Defining the delegated duties of the management team, including the owners corporation manager and the building manager, if applicable, and overseeing the execution of their work. They're also responsible for ensuring the members of the owners corporation, so all lot owners, are kept informed of issues, particularly pertinent issues, issues of uh, contention affecting the, the common property. The committee is also responsible for meeting as an owners corporation committee and subcommittee as required to review the various reports, including details of contractors' work performance and to follow up outstanding issues. Moving on to the Owners Corporation Chairperson. The Chairperson acts on the directions of the Owners Corporation and Committee. They convey committee instructions to the Owners Corporation Manager regarding the outcomes of committee decisions. They act as the point of contact between the Owners Corporation Committee and the Owners Corporation Manager. They coordinate and direct the committee as required, and they chair committee meetings and ensure that the committee functions properly that there is a full participation during meetings, that all relevant matters are discussed and that effective decisions are made and carried out. A chairperson may have a second vote, also known as a casting vote, in the event of a tied vote of committee members. 
Moving on to the role of the Owners Corporation Secretary. The position of the Secretary of the Owners Corporation is generally held by the Owners Corporation Manager, who has been delegated specific duties. These duties include uh, the acting on the Owners Corporation or committee's instructions, organising meetings and ballots of the committee, and is responsible for sending out notices, writing and issuing minutes, and other correspondence on behalf of the Committee of Management. So the Owners Corporation Manager's responsibilities are to manage and administer the affairs of the Owners Corporation under the instruction of the committee or Owners Corporation as a whole. Provide advice and guidance to the Owners Corporation and committee. Action the instructions of the Owners Corporation committee and general meeting decisions. Arrange quotations and repairs for building maintenance where there is no building manager engaged. Help the owners corporation comply and remain updated with legislative obligations. Administer the finances of the owners corporation and further to that, prepare and distribute financial statements and budgets. Plan committee meetings, including developing the agenda, registering the attendance and taking apologies for the meeting. And to convene, attend, and report at the annual general meeting to the whole membership, not just the committee, to everybody in relation to particular uh, events and functions throughout the year. Moving on to the building manager or building manager attendant. And certainly we understand that not every property is gonna have a building manager or attendant. And therefore this only relates to those properties where one has been engaged by the owners corporation. So the building manager or attendant uh, is responsible for assisting with the day-to-day -day running of the building or property. To manage the common property in accordance with the instructions of the committee, to supervise tradespersons and visitors on common property. Attend to the maintenance and repair of the common property or service infrastructure, working in line with budgetary parameters, uh, including the long-term maintenance plan expenditure. Review of works and provide approval prior to invoice payment by the owner's corporation manager. So making sure that any invoices come through uh, are marrying up with the works that have been conducted and communicating back to the owner's corporation manager if that hasn't uh, occurred. And also to maintain an asset register and contract register for the, the services relating to the, the property itself. Okay, moving on now to the committee operation. So the functions and powers of the committee of management. An owner's corporation may delegate to the committee all powers and functions except those that require a unanimous or special resolution. Day-to-day uh, -day authority and decision-making responsibility is the function of the committee and also the committee may delegate powers to an owner's corporation manager, to a building manager or to other individuals uh, involved with the owner's corporation. Now we're looking at the duties of the committee. So a member of a committee or a subcommittee of an owner's corporation must act honestly and in good faith in the performance of his or her functions. And must exercise due care and diligence in the performance of his or her functions. And finally, must not make improper use of his or her position as a member to gain directly or indirectly an advantage for himself or herself or for any other person. And there will be a, some changes to the owners' corporations coming into effect as of the 1st of December. And they'll clarify also that a committee member must act in the best interest of the owners' corporation at all times. Now we're going to look at subcommittees. So we have the, the overall committee of management, which is elected at the annual general meeting or potentially a special general meeting. But when it comes to subcommittees, this can be formed by uh, the committee itself and uh, are subject to the owners corporation rules. So subject to the OC rules, a committee management can be can form a subcommittee. And generally speaking, subcommittees uh, attend to issues such as financial management, property maintenance, dispute resolution, community and sustainability. Subcommittees may include non-committee management members who are subject matter experts to advise on specific issues. Subcommittees are a great way to tap into the energy and enthusiasm that may exist among some owners on a specific subject. So there, are, there may be some owners in your owner's corporation 
who may not wish to be involved in the committee of management because they don't have the time uh, to do so. However, if they're quite enthusiastic about a particular issue, then why not get them involved in the subcommittee so they can focus their energy in, in that regard rather than on the whole governance of the owners corporation. Subcommittees res results in a more inclusive and informed owners corporation. As mentioned, it gives people with a specific interest a voice. And many of the same requirements as the committee, including agendas, minutes, and quorums at meetings must be met. Now I'll talk about decision-making of committees of management. Decisions of the committee can only be made at a duly convened committee meeting or by ballot, whether that is a postal or email ballot. And sometimes we're doing ballots online uh, via a, a function on our website at the moment, which is being very well received by our clients. So a committee member can appoint a proxy to represent them at a committee meeting if they'll be absent in accordance with the owner's corporation rules. Subject to delegations, committees have the power to pass decisions that are bound by ordinary resolutions. And as per that quote down the bottom, a decision by the committee management is treated as, as a decision of the owner's corporation, and therefore, this should not be taken lightly. General owner's corporation ballots. So we have ballots at a committee level, but we also have ballots at an owner's corporation general level as well. General owner's corporation ballots may be arranged by the chairperson, the secretary, the manager, if instructed by the committee, or by 25% of the lot owners of the owner's corporation. They can be conducted by email or by post. And the most common form of ballot is email. Most decisions and resolutions will be passed this way. They're noted and may be ratified at the following committee meeting. With the amendments to the Owners Corporations Act coming into effect as of the 1st of December this year, 2021, ballots will run for 14 days and may close earlier if the, the matter is urgent. Now coming to the heading of best practice guide to committee meetings. So we certainly recommend to our clients to adopt these best practice uh, guidelines and they include to read all attachments and review any quotes or additional papers provided prior to the start of the meeting. For, to bring to the meeting a copy of the agenda and associated uh, attachments. Limit conversations, discussions on most matters to five minutes per meeting. To participate fully on all matters and make informed decisions. We encourage committee members to not bring individual matters in relation to members' lots before the committee and refrain from participating in discussions of matters relating to the members' lot unless it is an agenda item. And to ensure meetings remain productive, it's suggested to limit meeting time to a maximum one and a half hours. And what we like to do is encourage to get the committee to commit at the start of the meeting to a length of time, and therefore throughout the meeting, the, the chairperson can remind all committee members of that commitment and try and uh, conclude the meeting as per the agreed time. Committee meeting protocol. So we have the, the meeting notice as well as the agenda. Then the meeting notice uh, sets out the, the time, the, the date, the location of the meeting. And then the agenda lists all the items that are going to be discussed at the meeting. A committee meeting may be called by either the owners corporation as a collective, the committee, the chairperson, the secretary, the manager, or a delegate. The secretary must prepare the notice for the meeting, which must be sent out at least three business days prior to the meeting uh, commencement and include a time and place, and also an agenda must be attached to that meeting notice. In terms of a quorum, a quorum is the minimum number of members required to pass resolutions at a meeting. A quorum for a committee meeting is at least 50% of the members of the committee. When a quorum is not reached, the committee can make interim resolutions. However, these do not come into effect unless either confirmed by a ballot of committee meetings, by, by post, email, or procedures set out the rules about interim committee decisions are followed. Alternatively, uh, they remain interim until the next committee meeting is held and there's a quorum at that meeting.
Now, moving on to committee meeting protocol, rules of debate. The Act, the Owners Corporations Act, allows committees to determine meeting procedures, including the rules of debate. The Knight recommends the following be applied. Raise your hand to speak to the chairperson of the meeting. The chairperson decides who to speak, uh, who's, who's to speak first, or if two or more hands are raised, uh, the, the person who speaks first, obviously. A motion or topic cannot be put forward while a topic is still being finalised at the meeting. A motion that is put forward for a vote to occur is finalised when it is withdrawn, whether it's carried, agreed to, or lost. And a motion that is put forward by a committee member can also be amended or adjourned for, to a later date. So rules of debate can continued. Amending a motion. So basically a motion is a proposed resolution. So if you're a committee member, you would like something to be agreed to, you put forward to the other committee members your proposed resolution and all commit committee members must vote in favour, against, or they may wish to abstain from the vote itself. So it may be that you put forward a, a motion or a proposed resolution that another committee member wishes to alter slightly. So when it comes to amending a motion, uh, an, an amendment to an original motion becomes a new motion to be voted upon without further debate. If an amendment is lost with no further amendment proposed, the original motion stands. A second amendment should not be submitted until a first is finalized by the committee meeting itself. Notice can be given that a further amendment is to be put forward and an amendment must add to or subtract, subtract from the original motion. It cannot be the opposite because you're gonna vote upon that motion anyway, and it's either gonna be in favor or against. And as mentioned before, a meeting or motion uh, can be adjourned to a later date uh, whether it wishes to be, uh, whether a member wishes to vote upon that at a, another committee meeting in the future, or potentially a ballot, an email ballot in between committee mem uh, meetings. Now we're on to the committee uh, meeting minutes. The minutes must record the date, time, and place of the meeting. It must name the members who were present at the meeting and also names the members voting. All, and also the minutes must record the resolutions of the committee. Minutes uh, are to record the resolutions and they're not there to record everything that's been said at the meeting. Uh, basically, uh, there needs to be enough information within the res in the resolution itself so, so that when the, mini mini sorry, when the meeting minutes are being reread, people can understand the context, but not uh, verbatim in terms of what was discussed in relation to that motion itself. Minutes should either be confirmed as is or with amendments at the following meeting. Minutes should not be distributed by the committee prior to confirmation agreement by all the, the committee members. Until minutes are confirmed, they remain a draft document and should not be relayed, relied, sorry, relied upon beyond the committee itself. And in terms of that quote down the bottom of the slide, draft minutes may be used for direction to the owner's corporation manager and or building manager. Email approval of the circulated draft may be provided to facilitate actions to be carried out by the owner's corporation manager and or the building manager. Now coming to the code of conduct. We, we certainly uh, encourage all owner's corporation committees and their members to commit to understand the Owners Corporations Act, particularly as it relates to their own role within the committee. Assist with the work undertaken by the subcommittees, if there are subcommittees, so that the committee may make its decisions based on good information and advice. Not make improper use of their position to gain directly or indirectly an advantage personally or for any other persons or person. Not disclose private or personal information held in confidence by the committee, unless authorized or required by law to do so. Disclose any potential conflicts of interest to the committee. So if you're attending a, a committee meeting and you're a committee member and you've got some conflict of interest that may arise uh, throughout the, the remainder of the meeting, certainly it is your duty to disclose that conflict of interest at the outset. If you don't believe that there may be a conflict at the outset, however, 
throughout the meeting, uh, a conflict does arise, certainly it's upon yourself to declare that conflict at that point in time. Uh, respond to correspondents in a timely manner. So as committee members, uh, when uh, nominating for the committee, uh, you need to consider whether you have the time to ensure that you can commit to being a, a active member of the committee. And that includes attending meetings, but also responding to emails and other correspondence that may arise. And conduct yourself as a committee member in a professional and courteous manner and respect the views of other committee members. And as per the quote, all committee members must act honestly and in good faith and never use their position for personal gain. And just going back to that slide there, just to make the, the note that if you as a committee member are obeying by your duties to act in good faith and not to use your position as a for personal gain, then you will be immune from any action that may be taken by other owners uh, as a committee member. The Owners Corporations Act talks about immunity for committee members, and you must demonstrate that you, you've upheld the duties of your role. Moving on to policy documents. So committee policies should stipulate and cover the process for different practices of the committee. Should be agreed to by a resolution at a committee meeting or by a ballot potentially. And the policy documents develop over time and pass each year between successive committees of management. So some of the policies that uh, could be created uh, relate to the formalized code of conduct. And the night has prepared a, a code of conduct template that certainly we can provide to you if you don't have a copy already, which sets out what we believe a committee should follow. Also, we've created a conflict of interest policy that sits behind the code of conduct uh, policy itself. We've also created templates for procurement policies and communication policies that can be customized by committees uh, as they see fit. There may also be policies that relate to committee member participation policies. So uh, basically stipulating that as committee members, you must attend so many meetings and also respond within agreed timelines to correspondence that may arise between meetings. And also debt collection policies. So as per the Owners Corporations Act, there's a requirement that a process must follow to issue uh, fee notices to, to lot owners. You've got the initial fee notice 28 days and then a final fee notice 28 days after that initial fee notice has been issued. And then it comes to how the, co the Owners Corporation and more particularly the committee which is to then take action against any lot owner still outstanding with their owners corporation fees. So it may be that uh, an, another notice is issued to that delinquent lot owner prior to going to VCAT or the magistrate's court. But again, it's up to the committee to develop that policy, but as managers we will provide guidance to the committee in terms of what can and can't be done in respect of the, the requirements of the OC Act. So there's a number of changes uh, to the Owners Corporations Act that are coming into effect as of the 1st of December this year. So less than a month away. And those changes will relate uh, to a number of situations that will impose, uh, I guess, impacts to the, the committee of management itself. And there's also a number of changes to the Owners Corporation collectively. So this slide really identifies the changes specific to committees. So the committee size, the changes to the Act will now reduce the default number of committee members to seven members. So you must have at least three committee members and up to seven members. However, there is a requirement or there is an allowance to make it a determination to increase that number uh, if the committee uh, agrees to. The Owners Corporation Common Seal. The ability for the committee, if they have the, the delegated power to do so, to decide to discontinue the use of the Owners Corporation's common seal. So quite an antiquated device, the, the, the common seal, which needs to be applied to certain documentation of the Owners Corporation. And every time you apply the common seal to a document, with the exception of Owners Corporation certificates, two lot owners must witness the application of the common seal. So it can be a bit of a, a lengthy process to get documents uh, signed and, and witnessed by Owners Corporation members. And therefore, 
the, the powers B have decided that moving forward, the common seal doesn't have to be um, required, doesn't require. Moving on to committee proxies. A lot owner who is a member of the committee must not authorize a person to act as a proxy to represent a lot owner on the committee unless that person is also a member of the, of the committee themselves. And when it comes to ballots, this will be for both committees as well as the greater owners corporation membership. A ballot must be open for a maximum of 14 days unless an urgent matter needs to be decided on. And in that case, the ballot can close earlier. So what we've seen previously is that ballots can be open for, and the minimum that they're open for is 14 days and can be open for a lot longer than that period of time. So in order to try and reach a special resolution, which requires in the first instance, 75% of owners to agree, it's a lot more effective to have ballots open for a long period of time. So what we're gonna see now is that uh, ballots can only be open for that maximum 14 days. And therefore, when it comes to some special resolutions, it might be difficult to reach a, a verdict in the end, which is uh, frustrating. And certainly the, the peak industry body, Strata Community Association has raised their concerns with the, the lawmakers in that respect. And then in terms of this slide, uh, changes to the Owners Corporations Act that are gonna affect the greater owners corporation, not just the committee themselves. And that relates to proxies. So for owners corporations with less than 20 lots, an individual may only hold one proxy. For owners corporations with greater than 20 lots, an individual may not hold proxies for more than 5% of owners and that's 5% of the total membership, the total owners of the owners corporation. They can't hold proxy forms for more than 5%. When it comes to changes of the owners corporation rules, occupiers are now required to ensure guests comply with the rules. Both the occupier and the guest are jointly and severally liable for any breach, unless a copy of the rules has been provided to their guest. So you invite your guests around for a nice dinner party, and you sit them down and, and basically invite them to read the owner's corporation rules. And that means if they breach the rules themselves, leaving your, your dinner party, then you may be uh, not, not be liable for their behavior. However, if you invite them around and don't provide them with the rules and they, they cause a breach of the rules, then as a lot owner, you are both jointly and separately, separately liable for their behavior. Insurance. Owners' corporations may now levy an owner to cover excesses and increase premiums in some situations, or if the claim or increase relates solely to that owner's lot. And as good practice, the night has been, uh, I guess, promoting that any lot owner who makes a claim on insurance policies in the past is responsible for, for the excess payment. And certainly the changes to the Act solidifies that stance. Maintenance plans. So we're now going to see five tiers of owners corporations. We're going to have tier one, which is uh, more than 100 lots, right down to tier five, which is deemed a services owners corporation. Uh, so no common property uh, unless it's uh, a shared service, maybe a, a shared utility uh, service, or whether it's a two lot subdivision. So when it comes to tier one, and tier two owners corporations, and a tier two is more than 51 lots, they must prepare and approve a maintenance plan. And when it comes to approving a maintenance plan, an owners corporation must therefore strike a levy in accordance with the estimate of a maintenance plan. So for tier one and tier two owners corporations, a maintenance plan must be prepared for at least 10 years into the future. So what we're gonna see across the board is that a lot of owners corporations under the tier one and tier two banner will now be having to, if not already, implementing a levy for long-term maintenance obligations, to cover long-term maintenance obligations. Disposal of goods. So owners corporations will be able to relocate or dispose of goods which have been abandoned or on common property if notice has been given. Now it's not as simple as that. There's a lot of uh, regulations when it comes to a process that must be followed by the owner's corporation. It says notice has been given and the owner's corporation needs to prove that adequate notice has in fact been given 
but also there's a few hurdles to jump over as well. But certainly allows an owner's corporation, if they have followed that process, to dispose of goods uh, that are abandoned on common property. And I spoke about the need for special resolutions before and how difficult it may be when the requirement for ballots can only be a maximum of 14, business day, 14 days. However, with that being said, when it comes to legal action, currently and previously, a special resolution is required to initiate legal proceedings. So what we're seeing now is with the changes to the Act, as of the 1st of December this year, any legal action under $100,000 will only require an ordinary resolution rather than a special resolution. And uh, it, if the, sorry, the civil proceedings uh, proceed to the BCAT or Magistrates Court. Now, when it comes to committees, uh, a committee is automatically delegated uh, the, the power to pass ordinary resolutions for the owners corporation. That delegation can be removed at a general meeting, but it's, it's an automatic delegation. And what that means is that the committee now, as of the 1st of December, will have the ability to pass resolutions to initiate legal proceedings if the threshold is less than $100,000 and the legal jurisdiction is that the, the case either is within the, the magistrate's court or BCAT itself, which is going to see, um, my, my belief is that there's going to be a lot of uh, legal issues that uh, will be uh, going to these, uh, these courts and, and being dealt with and potentially open the floodgates in that respect. One of the initiatives of the night uh, recently is that we, we understand that the, the changes to the Owners Corporations Act, there, there's a lot. And therefore, we don't want to uh, try and, I guess, provide all the, the changes in one hit to, to our clients as well as uh, other prospective clients. So therefore, what we've, we've done is we're about to uh, launch an email training course, uh, which is free of no charge. And it will take up just five minutes of your day when it comes to reading about some of the changes to the owner's corporation updates. So um, everyone's used to now scanning QR codes. Feel free to take out your phone and take a photo of that QR code. And that will take you to the link to register yourself for this five minutes per day OC Act updates email training. Okay, so that brings us to the, the end of the, the official uh, presentation on the training. However, I, I do realize there's been a number of questions asked throughout the, the presentation that I'm not aware of, but I believe Tom is, is looking through those questions. So uh, Tom, are there any questions that you'd like to flag and, and answer that, uh, that have, have a reason? Yeah, Gregory, there, there have been a couple that we've received um, thanks for the presentation as well, sir. That was fantastic. Um, a couple of a couple of questions we've received in regards to um, inactive committee members. Um, note that um, uh, our colleagues Lucas and Alex in the background have, have responded to that. Um, obviously, referring back to the regulations, that if if a committee member is absent from twenty five percent or more committee meetings within a six month period then the committee can resolve to remove that member. Is that gonna, do you see that uh, taking effect? And, and how often is that used, Gregor, in your experience? Well, just so I was just sidetrack reading a few of those questions. So if you can just repeat that, I can certainly provide a response. I was just, just curious as to how often the um, ability for a committee member or a, a committee of management to resolve to remove a committee member is used. Certainly. Well, um, it's not often that an owner's corporation will get together to remove a, a committee member. So as per the requirements of the Owners' Corporations Act, a, a member of the committee can only be added or removed at a general meeting of the owner's corporation. So that's the, the collective owner's corporation rather than at a committee meeting. So uh, what, what I've seen in, in my, uh, I guess, uh, journey through uh, the my time in industry is that it's occurred a couple of times and, and generally speaking because uh, of committee members not being active and therefore committees finding it very difficult to actually uh, reach a de decision at times because you may have uh, 10 people on the committee but then there's only three or four active committee members who attend meetings respond to correspondence and therefore 
it's, it's very hard to achieve a quorum in order to actually pass a resolution. So in that regard, that's when committee members have been removed. However, it must be at either a general meeting or special general meeting of the owners corporation. With that being said, it is to be noted that a chairperson can be removed by a committee. Uh, however, that chair, it's only the role of the chairperson. That person who is a chairperson can't be removed from the committee themselves. They will still remain as a committee member, but the role of the chairperson, uh, they will not have that responsibility anymore. And also, okay. sorry, Tom, just further to that, there have been situations where uh, there, is, there has been a committee member who's caused, uh, I guess, grief and uh, issues to the, the, the reigning committee, and therefore a committee has actually uh, convened a special general meeting and, and, and got the support from the, the collective owners corporation to remove that committee from remove that committee member from the committee. Fantastic, sir. Um, so here's a question that, that's um, there at the moment from Sue McKnight. What will happen if a lot owner nominates a person as their proxy, but that person already holds a proxy, so can't accept another proxy? Will the OC manager advise the lot owner? Will the manager suggest another person be given the proxy? How would you answer that, sir? This is a very tricky one. So we're talking about... Um, in terms of the limitations when it comes to the number of proxy forms held by individuals moving forward. So as mentioned earlier, there is a narrow limitation. So for, I believe, less than 20 lots, uh, it's, it's one proxy, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, Tom, and uh, more than 20 lots, 5% of the collective uh, owners. So um, we've actually, I was speaking with uh, uh, the Department of Justice who are looking at the regulations in terms of the, the owners corporations regulations at the moment and will provide that feedback in terms of what happens if a lot owner already has a proxy or uh, numerous proxies if, if over 20 lots and, and how does that individual therefore determine which proxy uh, proxies to accept and the response was well it's really up to the individual to choose uh, which proxies they wish to accept so it may be that they've received um, a couple already, and it may just be based on a, a first, first in best dress scenario for that person, or they may, may wish to actually determine which people they wish to vote uh, or act on behalf of at a committee meeting or sorry, at a general meeting or um, a ballot themselves. It, it is a tricky question, isn't it, sir? Because, you know, that, that obviously goes both ways. It's whether or not um, the, the person appointing the committee, uh, the, the, the proxy, is comfortable with the person that they're appointing. Also, as much as, as you pointed out quite rightly, whether or not the person who's being appointed is happy to accept that proxy on behalf of that individual lot owner. Um, the, the question in regards to would the OC manager advise that lot owner um, yeah, I, I think the OC manager would. I mean, to a certain degree, I think um, it, it's up to and, and very much up to um, the owner who's appointing the proxy, again, to be comfortable with the person that they're appointing and actually reach out and find out whether or not that person would appoint would accept that, that proxy in the first place. Wouldn't you agree? Definitely. I 100% agree. Yep. And, and in a meeting, the certainly the, the owner's corporation secretary would uh, their role, and typically, as mentioned before, the, uh, the owners' corporations manager's responsibility uh, is to determine how many proxies received for an individual, and that would flag if it's uh, beyond the threshold that they're allowed to have. Yeah, really interesting question from Ken uh, here. Can the building manager be an owner and a member of the owners' corporation committee? Interesting in so far as the amendments that are coming up to the Act. Would you agree with that, sir? And, you know, that is in, in obviously the context that the Act is going to stipulate from the 1st of December that a committee member or an owner must not, it is actually quite interesting, that a lot owner must not repair, alter or maintain the common property of the owner's corporation or a service in or relating to a lot that is for the benefit of more than one lot or the common property. Um, so it's an interesting one, and this, this again comes in with the condition that it doesn't apply if the law owner has been expressly authorised by the, by the owner's corporation to carry out the repairs and maintenance in accordance with that section as an agent. So I think that actually answers Ken's, Ken's question, doesn't it? 
Yes, so it's certainly a tricky one. Um, as per that act, as per the act, the lot owner can't I just think this works, but if they're the building manager, then that's their, their duty uh, as engaged by the owners corporation. So um, as as we're not lawyers, potentially one for the lawyers to to consider. And uh, but um, certainly we, I can ask the question of a few contacts in the industry and, and try and get a response again and provide that subsequent to this uh, this presentation. Yeah, um, really, really, really interesting. Sorry, so go for it. So I've got another there's another question here from uh, Sir McKnight. So who is responsible for the duties of the building manager or tenant if there isn't one? Well, I, I guess just to make a, a point here that the, the role, the, the discipline of owner's corporation management is very different to the discipline of building manager. Uh, the owner's corporation manager is more the administrative, secretarial, financial uh, duties is, is what they're responsible for compared to a building manager who is responsible for making sure that the, the property is being maintained and the common property administered and managed on site. So when it comes to uh, who is responsible, if that person hasn't been engaged, well, sometimes th there may be a few services that the owner's corporation manager can pick up, but not, not really. It's, there is that exposure there. And, and therefore, um, owner's corporation committees should consider whether they uh, look at actually getting a, a part-time or even someone to come down to the property on a, let's say, quarterly basis to undertake an inspection. Um, and if not, then particularly potentially the, the committee members are responsible for making sure that the common property is, is safe and, and free of any, any risks. But we all know that committee members, it's a, a voluntary role and, and committee members have typically got you know, their own jobs to, to attend to. So um, it's a good question, but um, one that uh, should be considered by committees in terms of who is responsible for the, the operations of the building itself. Fantastic. A question here from Philip, which is that the new rules regarding committee member proxy where not already a committee member disqualify someone on the 1st of December, or can they remain until the next AGM? I think the question is more about the retrospective application of the amendments, Gregor. Can you speak to the, the attendees in regards to that? Sure, certainly. Well, my understanding is that these, these changes to the Act aren't retrospective. So anything that is uh, currently in, in situ will remain you know, status quo until there is a change. Uh, so uh, that's my understanding. Again, I, I'm not a, a lawyer, so, um, but we can certainly try and get some clarity in regards to that. Um, also, in addition to some of the, the changes to the Act, there's a, a transitions uh, period. So uh, for instance, the maintenance plans for any tier one uh, and tier two owners corporations, um, there's a, for tier one, I believe it's a, a 12 month transition and tier two, a 24 month transition for an owner's corporation to actually uh, prepare and approve that maintenance plan. So therefore, striking a levy to meet the estimated uh, expend expenditure of that maintenance plan is not required until uh, 12 months or 24 months um, as of the 1st of December. However, with that being said, we certainly do recommend all owner's corporations consider their long-term maintenance obligations and strike a levy uh, so that they're not having to face a special levy uh, if there's not enough funds to meet those costs at any point in time. So I think that actually leads to another question here from Anne, which is, um, and I'm going to add a little, bit, a little bit if I can, but I think I think it goes down to the requirements of the lower or the lesser tiers, and I don't mean that in, a, in, in the context that uh, lesser of any less importance, but the, the smaller owners' corporations and their requirements to carry out a maintenance plan. Um, do, you, do you consider it across the board a good idea to just for every owner's corporation, Gregor, irrespective of their, their location on a tier or on a schedule, to, to actually obtain a maintenance plan and, and carry out long-term maintenance in accordance with it? Definitely. Uh, so no matter how, how small a property is, certainly we encourage lot owners to consider the long-term maintenance obligations. So uh, looking, understanding the common property, understanding the common property assets and what the cost is going to be uh, down the line in terms of undertaking either major repair or replacement of a common property infrastructure. Now, there are, there are specialists, there are experts out there who can come in and actually prepare a maintenance plan for an owner's corporation. As owner's corporation managers, we're not experts in understanding the lifespan of infrastructure or what the cost is gonna to be to either undertake that repair or, or replacement. Um, there is that requirement uh, to prepare a maintenance plan moving forward for, for tier one and tier two. However, there's no requirement in terms of who must prepare that maintenance plan. Certainly the recommendation is to our, all our clients is that 
you get a specialist company, uh, whether it's a quantity surveyor or a, a company specialised in, in building, a consultancy, who can come in and prepare that maintenance plan. Um, and whilst uh, any tier below a tier two, so tier three, four and five, there's no obligation to strike a levy as per the estimates of the maintenance plan itself, we certainly encourage every owner's corporation to put at least some monies aside uh, to recover monies from owners to meet that uh, long-term maintenance uh, obligation. Because uh, otherwise, as mentioned before, if there's, if there's not enough money in the bank to, to fix common property infrastructure. And the owner's corporation has the obligation to make sure that the common property is well-maintained and um, any repairs are attended to. If there's not money in the kitty, then you have to strike a special levy of the owners. And that's when uh, owners do get a bit aggrieved because there's uh, um, there's that, not that planning in place to put monies aside so that they can afford the, the bills. Well, look, it can also place financial hardship on people as well, can't it, Craig? I mean, sure, surely, you know, in, in both of our experience, we've seen that, where, you know, um, people can tend to budget more around slightly higher quarterly contributions, they know when it's coming and they know what it's going to cost as opposed to a special levy out of the blue, uh, which may be due in, in a matter of weeks if it's urgent works. And, and some people just don't have the ability to put their hands on that on those kind of funds. So it, it's really an equitability perspective, isn't it? You, you, you pay for the owner's corporation common property while you're taking advantage of it, you're putting your money away for its maintenance and upkeep. Therefore, when it passes on, if you if you sell in a couple of years' time, um, you, you've put in your two cents to to make sure that you've you've paid your share, and there's someone coming in and takes advantage of that as well. And that's right. And a lot of uh, savvy purchasers will actually look at the owner's corporation certificate, which is which forms part of the section 32 document, which is the contract contract of sale for an apartment, and they'll actually go through and understand whether there's monies in reserve for long term. Uh, for maintenance uh, and also whether there's a special levy for that long-term maintenance obligation as well. Uh, also, just uh, with that being said, in terms of striking a special levy, there are other ways to, uh, I guess, fund works that, are, that arise uh, out of the blue, and, and that is borrowing monies from a financial institution. And, and we see that the big four banks don't get involved in lending to owners' corporations, but there's a number of other institutions out there, whether it's uh, Macquarie Bank, Atlantic Strata Finance, uh, Strata Loans. Um, there's a number out there who can loan monies to an owner's corporation. However, with that being said, the interest rates are, you know, can be as high as eight, nine, ten percent in terms of the uh, the repayment. So, um, in terms of being, I guess, uh, uh, financially prudent, uh, again, uh, that that future planning for an owner's corporation, you're going to be better off uh, striking that levy, maintenance plan levy, putting monies aside rather than having to loan monies and then pay that, that interest over a period of time. There's actually a couple of questions here, Gregor. I'm going to combine them because I think they, they both go into um, duty of disclosure to a certain degree. Um, the, the first one is is here from Jeff, and, and it talks about when a committee member um, acts or, or is it, it, perhaps shows um, committee information entrusted to the committee um, to another member of the family or the household and, and what happens with that information. Uh, another question that was there, which is whether or not um, the, the people who have voted for or against a particular motion in a meeting, be that via the committee or be that in a, in a special general meeting, should be named in minutes. It, it's a tricky question. It really is because, I mean, at the end of the day, it should never be um, an, an owner's corporation and a committee of management, and correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, inevitably, where you know, it, it goes down to those core duties to act uh, with due care and diligence in good faith and never seeking to make an advantage or take an advantage for yourself or another person. Uh, to, to me, that they're the fundamentals and the, they're the obligations of the, of the, the committee of management as stipulated by the Act. Do you have anything more to add to that? Yeah, look, I guess it goes back to what I mentioned in the presentation that, uh, you know, information should be kept confidential at a, uh, a committee level. So, um, you know, in terms of, of sharing information, um, that may only be, I guess, uh, uh, provided by the owner's corporation manager to the committee. Uh, that should be limited to the committee members. Um, 
it is to be noted that there is information that uh, um, all lot owners are entitled to, to view. Um, the owner's corporation register and records can be inspected by any lot owner at um, any point in time, uh, reasonable time, uh, mind you. But um, yeah, look, it is it is difficult. There, there are situations that may arise where there's a legal situation that really um, the committee are the ones who are dealing with it and therefore the, the information needs to be restricted to the committee. And um, we've had situations arise in, um, you know, during my, my journey in terms of the committee actually, uh, the, the situation has been very confidential and therefore uh, required other committee members to sign confidentiality agreements as a result. And uh, you know, I guess the situation um, in mind is that uh, there was legal action take, being taken against the, the original builder in terms of defects and um, the committee didn't want other members who may have a relationship with the builder to understand what the uh, the approach um, of the committee or the owners corporation was going to be in terms of that legal proceeding. So, um, yeah, th those types of things really integral for the information to remain confidential. Um, in terms of, uh, there was, that was one part of your question, there was another part to your question there, Tom. Um, and, and, and that that was no, really well said, and I, and I think um, you know the key point to it is whenever there's legal complexity to any question within an owners corporation, um, best to seek legal advice. Yeah, uh, that that is fundamentally the point. And as you said, I mean it, it really is um, a, a matter to assess. Second part of the question was whether or not uh, disclosure of the names of people who voted in favour or against or abstained from a motion should be included in the minutes of the meeting. That's right. Uh, thank you for reminding me. Um, look, there, there's debate as to whether the names, every single person needs to be recorded in terms of their vote. Uh, look, you know, there, there's not, the Owners Corporations Act doesn't stipulate that that is a requirement. Um, however, some committees may wish for that to occur and really it comes down to the committee in terms of uh, how they wish to uh, proceed as a, a committee of management. And so uh, typically what we suggest is that um, you need to advise if there's a, uh, you know, a unanimous resolution, which is with all committee members agreeing or whether it's a resolution in the majority and therefore we'd have some members disagreeing to the, the motion. So it really comes down to the requirements of the committee themselves, but um, there's no requirement to actually stipulate every single committee member and how they voted, um, I don't believe. Well, I think that also goes to the, demo, the, the democratic nature of an owner's corporation and a committee of management, yeah? So that um, it, it's completely fair and equitable. Everyone who can vote has a vote. A motion's put, either if, if you vote in favour or against, irrespective, you walk out of that meeting unified as either a committee of management or an owner's corporation, that democratic process has been undertaken uh, and the outcome is fair and just. And so it's not about who voted where, it's about the outcome and, and the process of the meeting. Yep. Any other questions? I, I just wish to reiterate that uh, certainly the, the recording of this uh, presentation and, and training session will, will be provided to all attendees, as well as the slides as well. The slides will be uh, emailed to every person who has participated. So that was one of the questions I see there. There, there's uh, quite a, another another question here in regards to maintenance plan. Um, if a maintenance plan, and, and maybe this is the one that we'll finish up on, Gregor, uh, if a maintenance plan has been prepared and the OCC doesn't believe it adequately addresses upcoming maintenance of the building, can the OCC members be actively involved in the process when due, be part of the walk around, so to speak? Can they get involved in, in that review process? Look, ultimately, the, the owners' corporation. Um, Makes the, makes the decisions in terms of how business is to be conducted. So when it comes to uh, creating a maintenance plan, I guess the recommendation that we provide is to engage an expert. Um, as, as owners, corporation managers, we're not experts in understanding, as I said before, the, the lifespan, the, the cost of uh, building repairs and, and maintenance. And typically speaking, committee members um, would not be experts, although there may be some committee members who have uh, you know, quantity surveying background or building engineer, you know, in, in the building industry and therefore have a, a good understanding of what um, the, the price and the, the lifespan may be. So I guess um, when it comes to getting involved in the process, if the committee wants to, you know, and we, we go back to the subcommittee, I certainly think that it, 
looking at the creation of a subcommittee of committee members to actually, uh, I guess, be involved in the preparation of a maintenance plan. And then if they want to actually get uh, involved in the, the preparation of the plan itself, then they may wish to do so. Um, yeah, look, I guess the, the, the plans are prepared by experts and they're an estimate in terms of what is going to be the cost moving forward. It's a, it's a fluid document. It can change over time based upon uh, markets, uh, I guess, uh, uh, dynamics, whether it's, you know, the cost of building materials or, you know, increase in technology in terms of, you know, the refurb of a, a lift, uh, those types of things. So um, it's, it's a guide, really. It's a guide to provide an owners corporation committee with an understanding of what would be the cost of, of maintenance in the future and an indicative figure to levy for so that the owners corporation isn't left um, hanging when it comes to the situation that may arise when it comes to building infrastructure. Hopefully that answers the question. Absolutely, fantastic. Thank you, sir. And as I said, I think um, that, that, might, that might be the one that we finish up on, sir. Certainly. Well, again, uh, there's a number of questions there. There's, uh, I think there's about 40 or so. I know that uh, the colleagues, my colleagues, our colleagues behind the scenes have done a superb job answering those, those questions. So we've got uh, Lucas Taylor, Alex Smell, Scott McCann, and, and also Ella uh, Shorten has done a fantastic job organising the, the webinar and presentation uh, this afternoon. But uh, if we haven't answered your question, just to reiterate, we'll certainly uh, endeavour to do so, and we will uh, create a FAQ document that will be circulated with the, the follow-up uh, to this webinar. Uh, it's nearly, as you say, uh, one o'clock, Tom. So I guess uh, thank you to, we've had about 70 or 80 participants in the webinar today. Thank you everybody for joining us. And hopefully we were able to provide some insight in terms of the role and responsibilities of the committee. And if you have any further questions, by all means, feel free to, to get in touch with myself, with Tom, or with your owner's corporation manager. Thank you very much.